What I'd like to do today is to give you a brief, well, not so brief, actually, <laughs> an overview of the nature of space-time, which is emerging from string theory. And as we'll see, it turns out to be radically different from the uh, space-time we're familiar with uh, in general relativity. So let me begin with uh, a few words about string theory. Um, oops, I'll turn this on. Okay, Gabriele gave a very nice introduction to string theory uh, two days ago. Um, and as he said, string theory starts with the idea that fundamental particles are not point-like, but excitations of a one-dimensional string. When you try to quantize a string in ordinary flat Minkowski space, you immediately discover that you need extra spatial dimensions for the theory to be consistent. Now this is not really a new idea. The idea that space might have more than three dimensions goes back to Kaluza and Klein in the 1920s. And the standard explanation for why we don't see more than three spatial dimensions is simply that they could be curled up into a very small ball or a very small compact space. The next thing you notice when you attempt to quantize a string is that it's much better behaved if you add fermions and require the theory to be supersymmetric. Now supersymmetry is often described as a symmetry between bosons and fermions, a symmetry which relates particles with integer spin to particles with half integer spin. But it's really much more than that. The formulations of supersymmetry envision that space has extra fermionic-like dimensions. So supersymmetry, if it exists, is really um, it's an extension of the Poincaré symmetry, and it really represents the first extension of space-time since Minkowski, since space and time themselves were unified in 1909. Now, uh, various speakers have commented on the fact that we've not seen supersymmetry. Carlo made a, a point of this, and, um, and it's true. It would have been nice if the LHC had discovered supersymmetric partners of the known elementary particles. But I just want to stress here that the super supersymmetry that we're uh, requiring for string theory is supersymmetry at a very, very high energy scale. It, it's the sort of fundamental scale of a theory. We'll see it's like um, the string scale, uh, or you can think of it as the Planck scale. That's what is needed to sort of get the theory uh, off and running. Um, there is a well-known problem in particle physics called the hierarchy problem. Why do certain scalars stay light and have masses that are much, much less than the Planck scale? And people invoke supersymmetry to solve that problem. That's what is in trouble and the fact that we don't see evidence of supersymmetry today at the Large Hydrogen Collider. But it's not really evidence against supersymmetry uh, that we need to, um, to start uh, or just, just to discuss string theory. OK. Um, now, Gabrielli said string theory was a theory of strings. That was originally true when <laughs> he did his fundamental work, and it was uh, largely developed. But we've now learned that it's much more than just a theory of strings, because string theory has other extended objects, which we call brains. The name comes from membranes, which are two-dimensional extended objects. But in string theory, we have extended objects of all different dimensions. There are uh, zero-dimensional extended objects, which are really like point particles. There are one-dimensional uh, extended objects and two dimensions, etc. Anyway, these brains, um, as Polchinski told us, are, um, can be thought of uh, at weak coupling as simply surfaces in which open strings end. So you can have open strings where the two ends are free to move along certain dimensions, like these dimensions, but are not free to sort of pop off uh, into the other space. And then, of course, we have these closed strings, which don't have any ends, and they're free to move uh, throughout all of space. OK, so an outline for this talk is the following. There are two 
main regimes where we understand string theory quite well. Uh, one is a perturbative regime, and the other is a non-perturbative regime. And most of uh, what we understand about the non-perturbative theory comes from this idea of holography that we've heard about earlier uh, in this meeting. And we'll see that each of these regimes have uh, tell us something about space-time, which is quite uh, surprising. Already at the perturbative level, um, we learn that geometrically different space-times can in fact be equivalent in string theory. And I'll give you examples. Uh, we learn that some singularities can be resolved. String theory is, just doesn't see certain kinds of singularities. And we learn that the topology of space can change. Okay, all of that was discovered quite early. There was this big superstring revolution in the mid-80s, and within, I would say, five years, by 1990, uh, all of this was, was understood. Um, then there was the second superstring revolution in the mid-90s, where we learned about non-perturbative aspects of the theory, and I will briefly, well, very briefly, say what gauge gravity duality is, because Costas gave a very nice uh, uh, discussion of that uh, yesterday. Um, but then I'll go on to say, what does holography tell us about the nature of space-time? Um, I will discuss some implications for the topology of space-time and singularities, uh, including some black hole and cosmological-like singularities. And then at the end, I'm going to conclude with some uh, words about emergence of space-time geometry. Now, I, I, I've learned at this meeting that emergence is somewhat of a loaded word for philosophers. <laughs> so, what, what I, what I uh, mean here is simply, in a regime where we expect the gravity to be classical and we have a space-time um, description similar to Einstein's theory, how do you recover the space-time metric from a different dual description? I'm not going to argue that one is more fundamental than the other because they are supposed to be equivalent. That's what the duality says. I could also talk about the gauge theory emerging from gravity. If we understood the quantum gravity side better, uh, we could also take that attitude. But for me, um, I'm going to be interested in uh, how do we recover a space-time geometry from these dual variables. Um, in, in a regime where we expect it to be well-defined. Okay, so let me start with the perturbative theory. A string is a one-dimensional extended object. It traces out a two-dimensional surface in space-time, which is called the world sheet. So we have this two-dimensional world sheet over here. Um, and we have a space-time with its usual metric. So perturbative string theory starts by assuming you have a space-time satisfying some equations, and I'll tell you where the equation comes from in, in a minute. Um, we're not imposing general relativity at the start. We simply have a space-time with some metric, and if you imagine that the, you know, there's some local coordinates x mu on the space-time here, and some local coordinates sigma on, on the world sheet, then the dynamics of the world sheet, or the position of the world sheet in space-time, is simply given by specifying the x's as a function of, of the sigmas. That gives you the embedding of the world sheet. In. So you are meaning that the string is embedded in a manifold with a metric g mu. Yes. In the perturbative theory, the metric, you start with a metric, and the string is propagating in that space-time, and so the world sheet is embedded in that. It's not Lorentzian. You are not assuming this. Oh, I, I will assume this is a Lorentzian metric. Yeah. For it's right. one of the consistency conditions, probably. Right. We have no ghost. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. Well, physically, it should be. I mean, th this is not the full theory, right? Clearly, we don't want to have to put in metrics. We want it to come out. We'll see that in the second part when I come to holography. But for now, yes, we have to start with a metric. We have to start with the space time. And the string is, in some sense, going to describe excitations about it, perturbations, or, or yeah, fields on the space time. Now, it's convenient to introduce a metric on this two-dimensional world sheet. This doesn't have any dynamics. It's just a sort of a convenient sort of auxiliary field that, that you can sort of introduce. And so the motion of the string 
is described by, by sort of some equation for these x's of sigmas, and that's a two-dimensional field theory. Uh, it's called a sigma model. I wrote down the action here, but I won't need any of the details. I just want to point out that there is this constant, 1 over ls squared in front, that is the string length. That, that's what sets the scale of string theory. It gives you the tension of the string. Um, and then it involves you know, some derivatives of x. It gives dynamics for these fields x, which embed the string world sheet in space-time. The space-time metric appears, and this auxiliary metric is, is useful to integrate over, over the world sheet. And one thing that you see from this action is that this is invariant under rescaling this um, metric Q on the world sheet. You can multiply Q by any function, and, and because of this determinant and, and the inverse metric, that just cancels out. But because it's two-dimensional. Yeah. Because it's two-dimensional, exactly. That's crucial. That's crucial. Right. It turns out that when you quantize the string, this conformal invariance is not always preserved. There's something called a conformal anomaly. And the theory develops dependence on this uh, conformal factor, this conformal uh, rescaling of the metric. And if you require that that symmetry be preserved, that the conformal anomaly vanish, you get an equation on G, on the space-time metric. So the claim is only for certain space-time backgrounds will the string remain conformally invariant even at a quantum level. And somewhat surprisingly, when you write out what that condition is, you'd find Einstein's equation. You find Einstein's equation to leading order in an expansion of um, involving this, this small string length. So you don't get linearized gravity. You get the full Einstein uh, equation at leading order, and then the corrections involve higher powers of the curvature. Things involve, you know, I don't know, the squares and higher powers of the curvature. So you really, really get general relativity out in, in, a, in a limit when all the curvature, uh, the radii of curvature are big compared to the string scale. The curvature is small compared to 1 over uh, ls squared. Um, and then, as, as Gabriele explained, um, you can consider the string with different, wormhole, with different world sheet topologies. You can put holes on the world sheet, etc. And that's um, understood, and there's, there's you know, good reasons for this, as giving a sort of quantum uh, loop expansion for various uh, processes. It gives different orders in a, in a quantum uh, expansion. Okay. But now I want to emphasize that the role of space-time has changed dramatically. We're not talking about fields on space-time and writing equations for them, or even the metric itself. We're not, they're not starting with an equation for the metric. What we're starting with is the sigma model, in which the metric just appears over here, acting as coupling constants for the dynamical fields, which are the x's. Okay, so the metric becomes, in this perturbative string theory, like a coupling constant. And the string only knows about the metric through this sigma model. So two different space-times, which happen to give you the same sigma model, are indistinguishable. And strings can't tell the difference. Yeah, I was just going to suggest you emphasize that this g actually depends on x also in general, of right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. They might have assumed that it didn't by the way it's written. Oh, sorry. Yes. This is, of course, a metric on space-time. The x's are the coordinates of space-time. So sure, yes, I, I would have been clear, I guess, that this is a function of capital X, and, and this X is, um, yeah, a function of sigma. So yes, you're, so you're using the metric where the string is, right? Okay, so this is what I just said. The string only senses space-time through the sigma model, so you can have two metrics which are indistinguishable if they give you the same sigma model, and apparently trivial changes to the sigma model correspond to dramatic changes in space-time. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first is something called t-duality. And this, um, I'm going to claim, uh, shows that geometrically different space-times can be equivalent. And basically, um, what you do is you start with a space-time which has some symmetry 
uh, a U1 symmetry. So you have symmetry, which is um, well, like a rotation or a translation around a circle. Um, and if you start with a space-time which has a symmetry like that, you can do something which is pretty much a change of variables within this sigma model action. And you write the same, the theory doesn't depend on which variables you used uh, to describe it. Under this change of variables, you rewrite the sigma model in a new form in which the metric has changed. Um, and the circle in particular of the symmetry has now different radius, basically one over the previous radius. The simplest case is if you just take flat space time, you compactify one direction into a circle. So you just take one of the usual directions and periodically identify it um, after a finite translation. Uh, if you compactify onto a circle, then the radius of that circle uh, is equivalent to one with radius this string length squared over r. So strings can't tell the difference between a space-time with a very big circle and a space-time with a very small circle. So what's the meaning of the statement, if the space-time has a symmetry around the circle, means what, is, what does it mean? Space-time has a symmetry around the circle? Means what? It, it means it has an isometry. I, I want to take a metric which, which has a killing field, if, if you know that language. It has a killing field with closed orbits. Okay, that's what Minkowski would do. Uh, Minkowski would do if you periodically identify. Yeah. Yeah. If you periodically identify, right. Okay, but there's a good intuitive reason why something like this might be true. Because if you think about, okay, here's flat, this is just a flat cylinder, right? Flat space with one direction compactified. Um, a string has two kinds of modes, qualitatively different motions. One is a little string here moving around the cylinder. This behaves like point particles, and quantum mechanically, the momentum must be quantized. It can only appear in integer multiples of 1 over the radius. So the energy of these kind of states is some integer divided by r, divided by the radius. Um, that's the, the momentum of these states. Alternatively, you could have a string wrapped around the circle, and because of tension, those states are going to have energies which are proportional to the radius. So by changing r to 1 over r, you're simply interchanging these winding modes with the momentum modes. You're interchanging the states with energy proportional to r and energy 1 over r. Now, it's less trivial, but also true, that if you look at interactions of strings in this space, they are the same. Um, that, that, you know, between these two uh, spaces, that you can't tell, there's nothing you can do basically by scattering strings to distinguish whether your space has a very big circle or a very small circle. And so this is the simplest example of two space times which general relativity would tell you are obviously different. There are invariants which are different, the size of the circle, um, not a coordinate effect, nothing, it's absolutely different geometries and yet in string theory they're completely equivalent. Okay. Now there's something else called mirror symmetry, which shows that topologically, not just geometrically different, but even topologically different space times can be equivalent. Um, this is a little bit more subtle, but what happens here is um, we understand that the space time, these superstrings, I don't think I mentioned, are consistent in a total of 10 space time dimensions, nine space plus time. So, the simplest type of um, compactifications uh, that people have studied are where you have four-dimensional Minkowski space, the usual three space and time, and the other six dimensions are curled up into a tiny ball. Um, that ball has to have particular geometries in order for the four-dimensional effective low energy theory to, um, to be nice, to have some residual supersymmetry, for example, and those particular uh, compact six-dimensional manifolds are called kalabi yau spaces. Okay, it's just the name that, that was given to these spaces um, which when they have the right properties to be um, interesting in string theory. So you look at sigma models, these two-dimensional strings propagating on a space which is of this form, a product of Minkowski space and one of these kalabi yau spaces, and you discover that uh, uh, just changing a sign <laughs> Essentially, changing a sign in the sigma model 
changes its interpretation from a string on a space M4 cross 1 Calabi-Yau to uh, strings moving on a Minkowski space cross a different Calabi-Yau, K prime, where K and K prime are not only geometrically different, but are, are in fact topologically different. Um, and this is what's known as mirror symmetry. So the, the strings just can't tell whether the internal geometry is, is given by one uh, space K or this other space called K prime. And, and, and this K and K prime are, are called mirror manifolds. And this invariance of the string is known as mirror symmetry. What's the sign you're changing? Yeah, so, so the sign, it's not something you see in the bosonic sigma model that I wrote down. You need to include the fermions and you need to include uh, supersymmetry. And, and in fact, um, so there's some U1 current associated with the fermions in the uh, signal model, which changes sign. And the, and the precise statement for the experts is that if you take uh, the superstring in 10 dimensions comes in a couple of different varieties. Like there's a 2A, 2B, etc. cetera. And, and if you take 2A string theory on one Calabi-Yau, it's equivalent to 2B on, a, uh, on this mirror Calabi-Yau. So there's a little bit of the supersymmetry gets, gets switched. Um, okay, but then, just from a logical viewpoint, isn't that not saying that two space times are exactly indistinguishable in string theory? Because you're changing the string theory at the same time as you're changing the space time, it sounds like. The result, it's, if you change what you start, if, if you think about the 10 dimensional string theory in 10 dimensional Minkowski space, they look different. But once you compactify on these two different uh, six-dimensional compact manifolds, the resulting theories are identical. So if you only look at the string on this compactified space, they, they are uh, indistinguishable. So you can't tell whether you started with one string theory and compactified on, on this manifold, or you started with the other string theory and compactified on that manifold. They just turn out to be the same. We'll come back to this. Okay. Are there cases where uh spaces which are both large on the string scale are indistinguishable, but they have a different topology in the check note. Uh, yes. yes. No, no. Th this doesn't require that the whole volume get very small. Ah. No. No. It's, it's not. Um, it's not. So they can be human size, you mean? I, I believe so. I, I, You're sure. I, 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 I'm not going to say I'm sure, because I can't <laughs> think of an example offhand, but I, I don't it's not, uh, no, I mean, that there's this formulation of, of, of mirror symmetry uh, that, that sort of relates it to T-duality, three T-dualities. T-duality, T1 is always small. Yeah, but it's only three. You, you take three circles and you T-dualize on the three circles. And, and so I'm hesitating, because those three circles, if they were big, are going to get small. Yeah. But there's three more dimensions. And so I'm thinking that maybe one can ch change parameters so the other three dimensions stay big and the overall volume stays big. That, that's what I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, but it's not, not obviously. The equivalence principle, if we are human size. Okay, continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a very dramatic test of this mirror symmetry. Um, it turns out that you can solve a math problem, a pure math problem, using string theory and mirror symmetry. Um, the math problem is if you take one of these uh, compact six-dimensional uh, spaces, this Calabi-Yau space, um, so those spaces can often be described in algebraic geometry. So, that they, so you can write down some algebraic equations for, for the surface in, in say, a CN or something. And um, you, mathematicians, for some reason, are interested in the question of how many ways can you map an ordinary two-sphere into the Calabi-Yau space using algebraic equations. In particular, using equations with degree, you know, some degree n. That was a problem they were interested in. Um, and using mirror symmetry, basically calculating some string process in, in, one, um, in one case and, and interpreting it, reinterpreting it, in terms of the dual or the mirror uh, manifold, you could just read off, basically no work at all, the answer to this question. And the numbers grow extremely rapidly. 
If you're looking at sort of basically degree one linear equations, there are about 3,000 ways to do it. Uh, at n equal to 2, it's up to 600,000. At n equals 3, it's 300 million. And when you get up to degree four uh, equations, you're already up to 200 billion. Okay, these are extremely large numbers. Mathematicians, okay, this was calculated in a famous paper by uh, Candelis et al. in 1991. And at that time, mathematicians, through a lot of hard work, had managed to calculate the first two numbers. In fact, I think this, their, their, their number for n equal to 2 was slightly off from this. Um, but then this prediction came. They got uh, re-energized and worked harder. They, they found the error, got this number right, and then they eventually were able to verify these other numbers in traditional, you know, conventional uh, mathematical tools. But it was um, really one of the early successes of, um, well, of string theory and, and applications to mathematics that it was able to solve uh, some of the math problems that were not uh, solved before. Okay, now let me turn to the... Gary, is yes. this the same as the Gorm of Witten invariant or no? I think those are different. I think those are different. And why, why is it important to this one? Uh, you have to ask comes them. comes into semi-classical expansion. Why do you care about this? Um, they come in the A model, the one of Witten. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, yeah, I, 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 off is a, I mean, th th this comes out of string theory. These are like instantons, right? These are string world sheets right. wrapping, you know, non-trivial cycles in the clock. But yeah. why does the degree of the equation play a role in physics? <laughs> physics. I'm not sure it does. I think <laughs> this was a spin-off, right? That they, they solved the physics problem and then they just reinterpreted it and could, could read off these numbers. Okay, now let me come to singularities. Um, and I claim that string theory resolves certain singularities. But the first thing is to decide what we mean by a singularity in string theory. In general relativity, out of, after a lot of work, you know, it was understood in the 60s that the best way of defining a singularity in general relativity is through geodesic incompleteness. We had the famous singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose, but also the intuitive idea that if the space-time is geodesically incomplete, there would be point particles whose history just ends. Right? You couldn't describe what happens to the particle after a finite proper time, and clearly, you know, something singular must have happened to that particle. So it was a nice intuitive idea. But in string theory, we have strings. So the right notion of a singularity is whether a string can evolve for all time. And so we shouldn't be thinking about geodesic incompleteness. We should be thinking about test strings in our space-time and whether they have uh, well-behaved evolution for all time. And so uh, you can find space-times which are geodesically incomplete, and nevertheless, strings have well-behaved propagation uh, for all time. Uh, the simplest example is uh, a space with conical singularities. If you take even Minkowski space and just quotient by some discrete subgroup of the rotation group, um, you get a conical singularity. Uh, string theorists call these orbifolds. Um, but it's a space-time with um, which is geodesically incomplete, and yet it's easy to show that strings are perfectly well behaved. I mean, essentially because they're extended objects and, and the singularity is sort of point-like, um, the strings propagate right through these. Um, and anyway, there, there's some new states of the string which are somehow bound near the conical singularity, but there's a perfectly consistent story about strings propagating on these spaces with conical singularities and nothing bad ever happens. So that's the simplest example of a singularity which is not a problem. And the fact that the D0 brain, as you insisted that they are more than strings, uh, yes. a particle like soliton, Good. have no problem at the conical singularity. Well, that's in fact my second point here. Uh, not just the D0 brains, but all the brains. If you, um, I said that at weak coupling, you can think of them as simply surfaces in flat space where open strings end. If you increase the string coupling, or if you put a lot of brains on top of each other, then you start to see the gravitational back reaction. So those solutions have been found. Uh, we know what the metric looks like. And indeed, most of them have singularities, ordinary curvature singularities, at the location of the brain. 
Now, that's not a problem in string theory because we know that that singularity is really representing this stack of brains. And we could um, calculate strings in that background. Uh, in principle, not, not always so easy in practice, but in principle by using our understanding of the brains in string theory and doing the calculations that way. Um, now these two are examples of singularities which sort of are static. That they're, they're time-like singularities in the sense that the space-time is not changing uh, with time. Um, there are other singularities which can be uh, time-dependent, and one of them is a singularity which uh, shows, which is associated with certain types of topology change. Um, so, well, maybe I should just uh, give you. Um, so, so this is going to be an argument for how you see topology change. Ordinary in gen ordinarily, in general relativity, in order to change topology, um, you need to have singularities. There, there's a theorem that says that uh, if, if your space-time is, is non-singular, um, you basically, the topology of space doesn't change. Um, so now let me just uh, give you a little argument for, which will lead to topology change. So, if you have a string wound around a circle, um, I told you a moment ago that the mass went like the radius. It was just the tension and you go around. Now, if you're a little more careful, and if you've broken supersymmetry, so you don't have exact cancellation anymore, um, you discover that there's a zero point contribution to the energy. So, so the actual mass squared has the uh, term that you expect, and a small negative contribution um, coming from, say, zero point contributions. Zero point, you mean R is zero? No, I mean quantum. I, I mean these are zero point in the sense of quantum fluctuations. It's like the harmonic oscillator quantum mechanically can't have zero energy. Um, I mean, if, if, if the radius of the circle is much bigger than the, than the string length, then this term is negligible and, and this intuition works. But when the radius gets of order the string length, uh, this has an important effect. And in fact, if the radius is ever less than the string scale, the mass squared is negative. And so that's what we usually call a tachyon. Now in the popular literature, you sometimes hear tachyons described as particles going faster than light. But that's not the right way to think about a tachyon. Um, what a tachyon is in, in, in field theory um, is just an instability. So if you had a field, phi, and it had a negative mass, or negative mass squared, then it would be described by some potential, which is minus m squared phi squared. So that's just a potential that looks like this. And if you start with phi equal to zero, um, that's very unstable. The field is going to want to roll off and, and um, become large. So a tachyon is an indication of an instability. Uh, so phi equals zero is unstable, it rolls down, and one sometimes says that these tachyons condense. But it's really simply an indication of an instability. So you can ask, what does this instability lead to? And what it leads to is topology change. If you have a situation where your circle is bigger than the string scale out here, narrows down to become less than the string scale, and then becomes bigger than the string scale, then you have wound strings localized at this neck, which have negative mass squared. And uh, work by Silverstein and others have shown that what that evolves to, what this instability corresponds to, is this neck pinching off, and, and so the space becomes disconnected. And this is um, an example of topology change happening through a non-singular process uh, in string theory. That cannot be fully described in detail in string theory, the condensation. No, it, it, it can't be fully described in, in this perturbative, I mean, everything I've said so far is perturbative string theory, um, but they have very strong evidence, you know, talk about strings coming in, trying to get through, the barriers that develop. I'm on the positive side, but it's, we yes. would like to describe this in detail, you cannot. Right, no, so, so, so there's strong evidence that this is what happens, but it is, um, no, I and mean, this is uh, uh, evidence, not conclusive proof, I guess. Okay, but now I want to... May, yes. may I go back? Because I think uh, the previous question by Thibault, maybe 
he meant something different, or at least I, I interpreted something. Can you, for the conical singularity, yes. can you use these zero brains as probes? Yes, that's, that's what and I then actually see if it's that the space time is incomplete, or you cannot? Oh, that's what you meant. Yes. I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I, I answered the wrong question. Um, um, we can leave that to the later discussion. Yeah, yeah maybe we should, we should go yeah, 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 discuss yeah, that yeah, later. Sorry, sorry. That's what I meant. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've given some examples of singularities which are innocuous, that strings don't see or don't get affected by. It is not true that strings resolve all singularities. Uh, uh, what's that? It would be too good. <laughs> Well, actually, no, it would not be good. It would be terrible if, if it resolved all singularities, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, how do we know it doesn't resolve all singularities? Well, there's an explicit example, and that involves something called nonlinear gravitational plane waves. So everyone knows about the linearized gravitational waves. You perturb Einstein's equation. Einstein discovered this in 1916, and they've been seen in LIGO. Everything's terrific. Linearized perturbations around uh, flat space are, 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 are waves. Um, but there are also exact solutions of Einstein's equation corresponding to gravitational waves. Um, so these are nonlinear waves. Uh, you can write down the metric explicitly, show that it solves the equation exactly. And moreover, there's an arbitrary functional freedom in the solution. You can basically specify an arbitrary profile for your wave initially and find an exact solution where that wave just propagates along at the speed of light. Those solutions turn out to be exact solutions to string theory also. I said that the string equation can be thought of as starting with general relativity and then having these higher curvature corrections coming from this uh, condition of conformal invariance of the sigma model. But because the curvature in the plane wave is null, when you try to compute curvature squared corrections, you contract the curvature and the null vector has norm zero, everything vanishes. So you can show that these are in fact exact solutions of string theory. And moreover, it turns out that the dynamics of a string moving in these particular curved backgrounds is particularly simple. You can analyze it. You show that if you start with a string basically in its ground state and it gets hit by one of these waves, it ends up excited. It's basically the tidal forces uh, excite the string, and you get some highly excited string. Um, and so that's all been worked out. And moreover, you can take your initial amplitude to diverge at some finite place. And so this is now a singular plane wave. And when you do that, you find that the strings become infinitely excited and are no longer well, well behaved or well defined. So these singular gravitational plane waves are examples which were truly singular even in string theory. That Only in the alpha prime expansion, you don't, it's not the loop expansion. This is in an alpha prime expansion, but that's, I would say, what we should be looking at because we want to understand if the background, this is a classical solution, we want to know if it's uh, singular, so we should be in some sense be putting, you know, I don't know, classical strings not I mean, this first quantized strings in, in this background. We're not looking. Uh, actually, there probably isn't. Bare creation of strings in this thing. Not in a plane wave. Remember, Gibbons showed that, that, that plane waves expansion. don't. That's the loop expansion. But you were talking about the. Yeah. Okay. Let's right. But, but you don't have pair creation of particles. You don't have pair creation of strings. Loops, I. I well, okay, I haven't thought about loops. We, but but we're, not, we're not including loop diagrams in this. We're just saying. So you can create. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so that's an example of a space-time which I would argue is singular. It's a solution of string theory. It's singular, not just in general relativity, but in strings. So but strings get in. You're infinite. not forming a singularity by a process. You are starting right away. I'm starting with right away with, with a, a singular plane wave, yeah. sort of off at infinity, and which propagates, comes through. But you're right. We're not, we're not forming it yet. Yeah. That, that's going to come later. <laughs> 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 All right, but here's the part which is really good. If all singularities were resolved, you're saying, well, should we be disappointed that string theory doesn't manage to resolve all singularities? I say no. I'd say it's great that it doesn't resolve all singularities, because if it could resolve all singularities, then even space-times with a negative total energy would be allowed, 
Think about the Schwarzschild solution where the mass parameter is negative. That has a time-like singularity. No horizon, r equals zero is some singular point with negative energy. And, and we would want some reason for string theory to rule that out. If string theory resolved that singularity, these would be perfectly good solutions with negative energy, arbitrarily negative energy. And that would be terrible because then Minkowski space could be unstable, it could decay to these things, um, and we would have no ground state. Okay, so it's good that string theory doesn't resolve all singularities. And as I just said, I'm going to come back to the cosmological and black hole singularities a little bit later. Uh, perturbative string theory doesn't tell us anything about that. We, we need to go to the non-perturbative theory. Okay, so here we are. Non-perturbative theory, and of course the main lesson here is holography. That's, as we've heard, a statement that physics in a region is completely described by fundamental degrees of freedom living on the boundary. And as Costas Bacchus uh, explained yesterday, uh, the most precise formulation we have of this is uh, gauge gravity duality, um, which is the statement that with particular boundary conditions, known as these anti de Sitter boundary conditions, um, string theory, which of course includes gravity, is completely equivalent to a non-gravitational gauge theory, which can be thought of as living on the boundary of space at infinity. You know, at first sight, this sounds completely crazy. You know, you have more dimensions, you know, the, the field theory is just living on the boundary, the bulk is higher dimensional, the strings have all these other, you know, uh, modes and excitations. You know, when I first heard this, I thought that uh, Maldacena was crazy. I mean, this couldn't possibly be right. But it's now been 20 years. Uh, Maldacena's original paper has 13,000 citations. It's the most highly cited paper on the physics archive. Um, you know, string theorists write a lot of papers, I'll, I'll grant you that. But even so, <laughs> this is an enormous uh, number of, of tests of, of this idea. Um, and there are by now many, many tests of this, which have all uh, convinced us, even though there's no proof, it is a conjecture, uh, convinced us that there is uh, truth to this statement. Um, it's not obviously wrong. You might say, well, can't you just rule it out immediately? Um, and it's not obviously wrong because of this strong coupling, weak coupling nature of the duality. Um, when the string theory is weakly coupled and we have some intuition for what it should look like, the dual gauge theory is strongly coupled and we don't really have any intuition and vice versa. So, so there's no immediate contradiction with a statement like that. Um, just a word about what anti de Sitter space looks like. Um, so I wrote down the metric. Uh, these are, it's a metric in coordinates which cover the entire space time. Uh, if you didn't have the r squared here and the r squared there, this would just be ordinary flat um, Minkowski space. You have a couple of corrections and this turns it into a space of constant negative curvature maximally symmetric space of constant negative curvature, space-time, I should say, uh, and that's what anti de Sitter space is. Um, the important thing for our purposes is that if you simply multiply this metric by 1 over r squared to try to bring infinity into a finite distance, this is something which Penrose advocated a long time ago, if you want to see the global structure of the space-time, bring infinity into a finite distance, but do it in a way that doesn't change the causal structure. It doesn't change the light cones. So you do it by a conformal factor which goes to uh, zero. So in this case it's just one over r squared. And then you see that at very large radii this metric becomes uh, simply the product of time and an ordinary two-sphere. So it's just a cylinder. And so that's why the boundary of anti de Sitter space is sometimes called a static uh, cylinder. It's just a sphere cross time. And this also, uh, well, maybe not completely obvious, but it's easy to see that a light ray sent out from any point in the interior can reach infinity in finite time. It gets all the way out to r equals infinity in a finite time, t, and can come back and, and um, back to the interior. So one way to think about gauge gravity duality is like this. The soup, the interior, is the, quote, physical space-time, which has dynamical gravity. And the gauge theory is like the label on the outside. 
Um, but unlike an ordinary soup label, which only gives an approximate coarse grain description of what's inside, according to this conjecture, the dual gauge theory is going to give a precise microscopic description of everything that happens inside um, this space. The, the gauge theory is condensed. Ah, yes, it's a condensed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And why are Chinese cocktails in the box? What's that? There are Chinese cocktails in the box. Uh, that's a very good question. I don't it's remember. I must have got this from some Chinese. <laughs> it's not Chinese. It's just uh, flour de lis. Oh, 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 it's flour de lis. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question? All these computers. Oh, yeah. One says that one side is weakly coupled, the other side is strongly coupled. Right. Now, that uh, usually means that on one side you take the top coupling large and then on the gravity side you have a large ADS value so it's a weakly curve. Right. But from the point of view of loop of loop expansion, are you not on the same footing? I mean large n uh, you know one over n corrections are weak on both sides. Um, well, I mean, you, you, the loop expansion, I think. um, if you're at large n yeah, if you're at and, large and you are doing a one over n expansion of the gauge theory, yeah. then yes, that's a weak coupling so and it's weak to weak, but, but say. that is Except those, one over n. those one over n corrections are the perturbative quantum gravity corrections in the bulk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and, and the, all the tests have been done also including those corrections or oh there have been tests yeah. oh yeah there have been tests even at finite end okay. yeah okay. not not everything is at infinite end yeah. <laughs> but only only one loop things right and i mean very minimal tests no. well they're not as many no okay. but there are a couple so basically anomalies one one, one loop things one loop, yeah. there, there are these um what is it? Uh, some stringy uh, 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 Andy had a, a paper. I mean, finite n, you know, you can only have so many independent traces of, of powers of your matrix and it cuts off and then there's some corresponding statement in the ball. The stringy exclusion. The stringy exclusion principle. Yeah, so that's a finite n connection. Okay, um, I guess, well, I have to sort of now decide. Um, how, uh, how much time? I mean, th these 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 lectures are sort of <laughs> fluid. Um, easy, I can, very easy. <laughs> I guess I I, I have is till four p.m. till four. Um, Officially, it's four p.m. Yeah. Officially, it's four. I don't know if I want to go. Well, okay, I'll go through this uh, quickly. Um, okay, so I just there's lots of evidence in favor of this, and often it corresponds to calculating a particular physical quantity. Um, in, in two different ways. You can calculate it in many cases in the gauge theory, you can calculate it on, on the gravity side. The calculations look totally different, but at the end of the day when you compare answers you get the same answer. Okay, so that, th there's, there are many calculations like that I would say. Um, this is a little bit different. This is a little stronger um, in one sense. Um, it also assumes a little more. So uh, there was a famous paper by Lynn Lunin and Maldacena um, who uh, studied the correspondence for a class of states which preserve, say, half the supersymmetry. I haven't emphasized supersymmetry, but when you have some supersymmetry, everything is under better calculational control. And what they show is that in the gauge theory, all the states that preserve half the supersymmetry are created by a single homogeneous field. So nothing depends on the sphere anymore. It's basically a field um, which is independent of space, and it's just an n by n matrix because of the gauge uh, aspects. So you basically have a matrix model, um, like we heard about uh, yesterday. Um, and the matrix model can be quantized exactly. Um, it turns out that it can be related to a fermion, a free fermion. And the states are described by, I say, closed curves in a plane, but really they're described by diff different regions of a plane. You have a two-dimensional plane, which can be thought of as like the phase space for this fermion, and you can either occupy that site or not occupy it. And so you can think of these colored regions 
as the, as the sites which are occupied and the white regions as the ones which are not occupied. So this gives you a pictorial description of, of the states of, of, of this uh, gauge theory with this half supersymmetry. Now you go on the gravity side and you're supposed to compare this with something uh, solving Einstein's equation. Um, it turns out that if you again assume half supersymmetry um, it simplifies Einstein's equation a lot. Um, you can find a large class of solutions which are stationary, they're time independent, they're non-singular, no horizons or singularities anywhere, but they can have complicated topology, lots of different you know, topological uh, stuff, um, and the whole class of solutions is characterized by a uh, linear equation in two plus one dimensions, it's, it's uh, no, it's stationary, so it's actually a three-dimensional uh, Euclidean type uh, uh, equation. But the amazing thing is that the boundary conditions that you need to specify the solutions, which are all smooth, are again uh, closed curves on a plane. So it turns out that um, the solution has uh, two different spheres in it, and, and this plane corresponds to points where the spheres shrink down to zero size, if the solution is going to be non-singular, you need a certain metric function to have a particular value, so everything is regular. And basically, um, you know, setting it equal to 1 or 0 uh, makes sure that it's, everything is smooth, but if it's some other value, it's not smooth. So you get um, the same, exactly the same picture of the gravity solutions with half the supersymmetry and, and the uh, gauge theory solutions with states with half the supersymmetry, and so you see a sort of a direct map in this case between the state of the gauge theory and the configuration on the gravity side. Um, and so, you know, the full quantum description of this sector is given by the quantum matrix model. That's, uh, that's the third. Okay, I wanted to go through that because there's been a very recent uh, observation by Berenstein and, and Miller just earlier this year that goes beyond the statement that string theory can change topology in a smooth way. That we saw that even perturbatively. What they argue is that there are situations where topology is not even well defined. There cannot be some sort of quantum Hermitian operator which tells you, whose eigenvalues tell you the topology of your spacetime. And they argue as follows. Um, uh, they say that there are two topologically different spacetimes with the following property, that if you start with one and quantize the fluctuations about it, you know, set up some Hilbert space, you know, semi-classically of fluctuations about that, uh, and do the same thing with the other one, starting with the topologically different uh, background, you end up with some states that are common to both. So, I mean, in particular, what they looked at was the case where you only had a disk and that was one background, and then the other one was one with a disk and this annulus around it. Uh, forget that other crazy thing. So, so they considered those two solutions, with just the disk or just the disk and the annulus. Those are different topologically, uh, those correspond to, to space times with different topologies, but they showed that if you quantize fluctuations about one, you find states which are also realized by starting with the other one. And since it would have been natural to assign the topology, of, of all these fluctuating things, the same as your original base classical solution, you have states which can be designed, you know, assigned different topologies. So it just shows that topology need not be well defined in, in string theory. Okay, now I'm going to turn to singularities. A, very, a really powerful feature of this duality is that statements that are very easy, sometimes almost obvious, on one side of the correspondence imply highly non-trivial statements about the other dual theory. An early example was a statement that the process of forming in a, a black hole and letting it evaporate must be unitary because in the dual <coughs> description it corresponds to standard Hamiltonian evolution of a standard quantum theory. So we learn immediately that black hole evaporation is not going to lose information, even though we don't know the details of how the information comes out. And as we've heard, that's still, I guess Ted will talk maybe about this, it's, 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 it's still a topic of, of <coughs> controversy and ongoing research, but at least we know the answer, <laughs> that, that the uh, evolution should be unitary. What I want to do is to 
now tell you some other consequences of the holography which are follow from obvious statements about the dual theory. Okay, and this is based on work I did uh, with my stu student a couple years ago. Um, so first, a comment related to cosmic censorship. A long-standing conjecture in general relativity is uh, cosmic censorship, which states that if you take generic, asymptotically flat initial data, you can evolve, it has a maximal evolution that contains a complete null infinity. That just means that you can evolve for all time at infinity. So um, this is uh, part of what's called a Penrose diagram. Uh, light rays are always at 45 degrees. Um, these null 45 degree lines uh, uh, on the outside are supposed to represent infinity. That's what happens when you have an asymptotically flat space time and you can formally rescale so that infinity is brought into a finite distance. Uh, Penrose called it scry or, or I plus. So this is, this is supposed to be the boundary. Um, if you don't have any singularities, you take asymptotically flat initial data, you evolve it, and you can evolve for all time, which is sort of an upper half diamond in, in, this, in this type of picture. That means that nothing goes wrong, you can evolve forever. What cosmic censorship is supposed to rule out is the possibility that you evolve and, and you form a singularity, a region of, of, say, infinite curvature where classical general relativity breaks down and evolution would have to stop, in which case you only get a part of null infinity. Now, when Penrose proposed this in 1969, I think most people were hoping cosmic censorship would be true. That way, we could you know, predict everything that happens outside black holes without knowing quantum gravity. Nowadays, most of us hope cosmic censorship is false because it would allow us at least the possibility of directly observing effects of quantum gravity. Um, I should say, in more than four space-time dimensions, uh, we actually have examples uh, showing that cosmic censorship fails. Um, but in four space-time dimensions, three space and one time, the case of most interest, we don't yet have, um, well, it, it, it's much less is known. So, um, cosmic censorship says this doesn't happen generically, but if it did, it was always hoped that quantum gravity would somehow resolve the singularity and allow evolution to continue. I mean, that was always the hope. That's what quantum gravity was supposed to do. Well, I claim in gauge gravity duality, we know that happens. We know that that's going to happen because whatever happens in some region in the interior, if you have initial data which collapses and forms naked singularities, the dual field theory you know, it's just some Hamiltonian evolution. If the space goes on forever here, this quantum field theory is going to have a well-defined evolution. So we know evolution will continue past the classical singularity. Quantum gravity will resolve it. And furthermore, we know a few things about how it resolves it. Um, the quantum field theory, if, um, if the background is a standard static cylinder, is going to conserve energy. So it resolves it in a way that conserves energy. It, it will conserve angular momentum, so it will resolve, you know, it'll be consistent with conservation of angular momentum. That's an immediate consequence of, of, of holography. Um, and I should say, we, we, we know examples of classical solutions which do collapse to naked singularities in, in ADS. Um, they're not generic, though, so they're not viewed as, as, as you know, real counterexamples to cosmic censorship in four dimensions. Okay, now I want to talk about a different uh, result about singularities. Um, and this starts with uh, what seems like sort of an obvious question. Um, when can two quantum field theories communicate? Usually we think that if the quantum field theories are defined on separate space times, they can't possibly send signals from one to the other. So this diamond is supposed to represent Minkowski space, again, conformally, um, uh, compactified so that infinity is a finite distance away. You have future null infinity here, past null infinity there. We take two disconnected copies of Minkowski space, put a quantum field theory on each. Seems obvious they can't send signals to each other. When these conformal, sorry, when these quantum field theories are conformally invariant, there is a possible subtlety. 
Turns out it's not going to matter. I'll, I'll explain why in a minute, but let me just mention what the subtlety is. You can take Minkowski space and can formally map it to um, a finite piece of this uh, static cylinder. So this is just the S2 uh, cross R, and these are three-dimensional Minkowski spaces. Um, and if you take two different copies of three-dimensional Minkowski space, uh, you can conformally map both of them to the same static cylinder, or you can conformally map to two different static cylinders. And in this case, clearly you can send signals from one to the other because they're both embedded as part of a larger conformal field theory, whereas here you can't. Okay, so that's just to tell you that there is a slight subtlety in this obvious question, but now I'm going to tell you we're not going to have to worry about it because I'm going to cons only consider cases where the conformal field theory lives not on Minkowski space, but lives on this static cylinder. So we're going to consider theories where the conformal field theory lives on the product of a sphere and the line, where the line is time, uh, and then the problem doesn't arise because this uh, two, um, you know, theories on a static cylinder cannot be mapped into a single larger space-time because this is what can be called conformally maximally extended. You just can't put them together into a bigger, bigger space. Okay, so now we have what seems like an obvious statement from the field theory side, but we gave it a name. We called it the no transmission principle, NTP, which is the statement that if you have two conformal field theories, each defined on an infinite cylinder, S2 cross R, um, and if they have gravity duals, then no signal can be transmitted um, even in the bulk, from one bulk dual to the other. Okay, they're just, you know, they can't transmit a signal uh, from one quantum field theory to the other one on the boundary, so the same has to be true in the bulk. And this leads to statements about singularities because, okay, so now what I've drawn is one of these Penrose diagrams. Again, light rays are at 45 degrees. Let's look just at the bottom half. The bottom half is what uh, relativists draw as the standard picture of a black hole in anti de Sitter space. You recognize the time-like boundary here is just that static cylinder, and this is the space-time. Uh, this singularity is the black hole singularity. The dashed lines are the horizon, and because it's static, there's a time-reverse singularity, which is a white hole singularity. Okay, so this half of the space-time is a standard picture of a black hole in anti de Sitter space. And what I've done is I've just taken another copy of it and put it on top. Okay, so I say suppose we just take two copies of that and put one on top of the other and ask, could quantum gravity somehow resolve this singularity? It looks like a black hole singularity on this side, it looks like a white hole singularity from that side, but could it resolve it in a way that you could send a signal from this region through the black hole, have it come out the white hole, and come out over there? Well, you know, if you're just doing a gravitational problem and you're looking at that, you don't know much about quantum gravity, especially in a non-perturbative regime. Well, maybe, you know, why not? I claim that holography says the answer is clearly no, because if you could, you could then, you know, send signals from this CFT to that CFT, um, and that's clearly not allowed in the dual field theory. They live on disconnected spacetimes. Yeah. What if the two field theories were entangled? So if they were yeah, in some entangled state. So I'm just thinking <coughs> the that the two CFTs you've drawn the states are thermal field double states. Right. And you could think that these are two thermal field double states that could then in turn be entangled. Entanglement is not a problem. You certainly can have entangled states uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a system which had two uh, disconnected things. But you can't send signals using entanglement. It, it, it's, um, in fact, so there's, even within this, I haven't emphasized the left-hand boundary here, but even in this sort of standard picture, there is another asymptotic region on this side, right? We think there's another CFT here, and the standard black hole, as, as you may know, is described by some thermal field double state of these two CFTs. That still doesn't mean you can send a signal from this CFT to that CFT. Okay, so entanglement could exist, but it's not enough. It's not going to allow you to send a signal 
from one to the other. But two signals could intersect then? Yes, it could, but that's not what I'm asking. No, no, no. no right. No. Two signals could certainly intersect. That is possible in the gravitational description. What I'm asking here is could quantum gravity resolve this singularity in a way that the signal actually makes it out to the other side? And I'm saying we know the answer is no. I'm not sure I understand your confidence. So the CFT is conformal. That's why the C is. And so the, you, it's an infinite amount of time in a given sort of conformal frame. Right. To the, from the lower CFT up to that circle where the two join. Right. But I mean, the CFT doesn't know infinite time from finite time. So why couldn't one CFT just sort of flow into the next one? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, we, we definitely thought about that. Um, so first of all, you can make a more precise statement by, by um, say, foliating your, your CFT by surfaces and requiring that the volume of those spatial slices uh, stay bounded away from zero and away from infinity. Because um, any, any conformal factor which is going to bring infinite time to a finite time is going to shrink your spheres to, to, zero, to zero volume. So you can introduce what's called the standard conformal frame which sort of just forbids those kind of singular conformal rescalings. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll have something more to say about your other comment in just a second, whether you can sort of map the bottom to the top in some way. Um, and um, I, I guess I should say that um, when, when Carlo uh, gave his talk, I was thinking of this and, and thinking this might rule out the kind of uh, bounce that, that Carlo was, was thinking where he had a black hole which evaporated and then sort of came out in a white hole. Uh, but I realized uh, later that this doesn't apply because in Carlo's uh, situation uh, it all happens at finite time. You're, you're, evaluating, you're, you're evaporating to some finite time and then you want something to happen and, and so the CFT description would only go up to a finite time and then it can evolve later to something else. Okay, so it really doesn't have anything to say well, about it. Well here it has to go to infinite time. Yeah, yeah I that's mean... That's why you put two CFTs. Uh, two CFTs. Ah, yeah. I was going to ask why don't you put a single one? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that in a minute. I, I'm going to do that in a minute. Um, Okay, now this is the non-rotating black hole. Okay, standard Schwarzschild type black hole. But this is not generic. All black holes presumably have some rotation. They may have a small charge. And once you add rotation, the Penrose diagram, the causal structure, changes completely. And every relativity student learns that if you want to describe a rotating black hole or a charged black hole, you have something more like this, where, where the singularity now has become timelike. It's not space-like, it's timelike. If you're, um, this looks the same as before, you have a, an event horizon, now called the outer horizon here. If you jump in, you don't immediately hit the singularity, you actually can continue. There's another horizon, so-called inner horizon, in here, and, and you can keep going. So in classical general relativity, you get a contradiction with this no transmission principle. It looks like you can send signals from one uh, CFT to some other CFT on a totally disconnected space. So what's going on? Um, it is known after many uh, years and, and many uh, different uh, contributions uh, that this inner horizon is unstable. If you try to send a signal into a black hole like this, any small perturbation um, actually builds up and causes this inner horizon to become singular. It's a weaker singularity than the Schwarzschild singularity. It turns out to be what's called a weak null singularity in the sense that the singularity stays null at least for a while and the metric actually is continuous across this boundary but the first derivatives of the metric um, uh, blow up and they're, they're not square integrable and so that means you don't have unique evolution uh, past this point. So classical general relativity already tells you that there's going to be a problem, um, but the singularity is sort of weak. So you can again ask, could quantum gravity resolve it? Now, it seems like that's an easier job now for quantum gravity to resolve this weak null singularity rather than the standard Schwarzschild type singularity. But I claim the answer is no, because again, we have this no transmission principle which says that signals had better not, you can better not be able to send a signal from a CFT here to a CFT there. So even in quantum gravity, this singularity had better not be resolved. Okay. Um, 
Now what about cosmological singularities? Um, so there are CFTs which cannot be evolved past a certain finite time. Um, and I'll give you an example in a minute. If the boundary evolution stops at a finite time, then the evolution in the bulk had better stop as well. And that means that there must be a cosmological singularity which goes all the way out to infinity. A singularity which is space-like and goes all the way out to infinity, cutting off the evolution in the bulk. Um, furthermore, so there has to be an a singularity classically, um, and furthermore, that singularity cannot be resolved quantum mechanically into a bounce. There are various people in the audience who like the idea of a cosmological bounce, but what I'm saying is that at least in this context, with ADS boundary conditions and using holography, we have an argument which rules out these kind of bounces. Um, so first of all, what do I mean by singular conformal field theories? Why would the evolution ever stop? Well, the boundary theory is a non-gravitational theory. It, it lives on a fixed space-time. If you put it on a space-time with a cosmological singularity, if the boundary metric happens to be a space-time with a cosmological singularity, then the field theory evolution has to stop. So various people have looked at uh, models like that. Um, if you, you can destabilize uh, a CFT by adding a potential, which is unbounded from below. Um, and I just realized I should have uh, Gabriele's name on, on, on this. He's also worked on things like this. But you can... Um, Take a CFT, you modify it by a certain term in the action which basically causes the fields to run off to infinity in finite time. And that can cause uh, problems with the, the evolution. And finally, there's a case which, um, uh, well, I guess I'm not going to worry about that. It's not so important. Uh, sorry, Gary. Yeah. I mean, you show back, I'm not sure I understand uh, what you mean in number one. Yes. I mean, if you put a cosmological singularity on the boundary, this means you have put an infinite source for the energy momentum tensor yeah. of the CFT. Is this what you mean? So you are sourcing in a singular way the energy momentum tensor? Um, sourcing? I, I suppose that could be thought of that way, yes. Yes, the quantum stress tensor will certainly diverge there. Yes. So, I mean, what do you mean by a singular CFT? It's a CFT where you have done something terrible to a uh, source of... <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, it's, okay, you're going to say it's not the CFT's fault. You, you sort of... Yeah, it's not the yeah, CFT's fault. Okay, well, I, <laughs> I, I'm just calling anything in which evolution stops singular. Okay, this is singular because of, you, you've done it by hand. You've done it by hand. You, you, you've just put the background metric to be this sort of... Pathological. So it's not metric. what the CFT would like to do normally. No, but, but it doesn't have a choice. You know, you can <laughs> put whatever you want on the boundary and, and consider the duality with various boundary conditions for the metric. So, so you are <coughs> claiming that a bounce in the bulk yes. corresponds to having a singular CFT. Oh, no. it cannot correspond to having a singular CFT? Yes. Yes. But it can correspond to a non singular CFT? Um, <laughs> the question is, can a non-singular CFT ever have a cosmological singularity no, classically? A, a bounce. Oh, class. Because if, if you don't have one classically, you're not resolving anything into a bounce. Okay. You so, have the singularity classically. Okay. So I want to have the singularity classically and ask if the quantum gravity could resolve it. And to have it classically, you say, you, you have to take a singular CFT. That is not obvious. Okay, so I, I've given examples where we know the evolution on the boundary ends, and I'm going to say we know there's a classical singularity. There is a very interesting question. Could you have a situation where you get the cosmological singularity in the bulk in a way that the field theory doesn't become singular? That would be like a bounce. And, and um, that's much harder to do. There's one I can talk about it later with you. I and mean, there's one possible way that might happen, but but it's not been not not at all. Sure. But how about a small black hole singularity in the interior of ADS? Well, that's fine. Now, now, what do you want it to do? Do you want it to evaporate? Do you want to sit there forever? No, that's a space-like singularity. It doesn't go out to the boundary no. because it's inside. That's certainly okay. 
So uh, no, there's no problem with that. But it can't bounce. I mean, that's what my first slide was. You, you, you can't have that. Uh, no, and that's an eternal black hole. I was thinking about a small yes. black hole. A, a one that evaporates. Inside, yeah. Well, eventually, yeah. maybe. That's the one I discussed, isn't it? Yeah, so, so you could have one that evaporates. It's from collapse, so the one hand uh, is, is, is closed. Yeah, but classically... And the other hand is the end of the open evaporation, so it's fine at the inside. But classically it won't. I mean, I thought we are looking at classical geometric singularities. Um, yes, so, but that's okay. I mean, all, it could be that that remains sort of a future boundary in some sense. I mean, I'm not saying what happens inside. I'm just saying that you can't send signals through that singularity into another region of space-time which has its own asymptotic, the ADS boundary. But is um, this because the singularity reaches the boundary um, in your picture? Yes. Well, okay, let's... Uh, yes. <laughs> there, there, there are two cases, right? The cosmological case that I'm talking about now, yeah, yeah. the singularity reaches the boundary in finite then, time. Then yeah. In the black hole case, mm -hmm. it doesn't, right? The yeah, singularity so state... So why don't you no, have a thing. single CFP? Your picture before. Yeah, that, that, that was this picture. Yeah. So here you have a whole infinite CFT, right? It, it doesn't evaporate. And I'm, I'm saying, could you go through and enter a region with its own asymptotic CFT? Yeah, but, but, yeah so the, the point is whether the singularity has to go up to the boundary. Yes. Well, in this causal diagram, it does. It does. Yeah, even though physically this is contained inside a finite sphere. Even if it's a small black hole, it does? Yeah, even though it's small, it does. The pe th this is independent of the mass. You get the same causal diagram for any mass, even for a small black hole. For a small <coughs> one-sided? No, this is two-sided. Small one-sided, you would have you know, matter collapsing and some origin in the middle, and you just get half of it. But it still looks like that. To join an infinity means not to join. The yeah, yeah, th th this is misleading. You know, the yeah. singularity is not going out to the horizon is staying at finite radius. It's just causally. It, it, it's to happen at infinity means not to happen in these yeah. diagrams. Yeah. This, this is an yeah, artifact of the rescaling. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let me um, just uh, move on. I was going to get... Um, let me just go through a couple of these comments, because there was a question about this. Um, okay, I have to say that the arguments I've just mentioned about singularities are not universally shared by everybody working in holography. You know, my paper came out a couple of years ago. I've, I've given some talks on this. Uh, you know, nobody has convinced me that they're wrong, but I have to say there's some people they who... Tried. They tried. <laughs> but they tried. They tried. It's, it's ideas that are out there that are, you know, so don't take it as gospel, okay? It's not, not it's something... Again, just everyone. Well, so what is the statement on the previous transparency? Can you repeat the... Uh, this was just an example. Uh, do yes. you want to see the example? No, the statement again. The statement is that, okay, the statement is here. If you have two conformal field theories, each defined on a static cylinder, S2 yeah, cross the R. The application you made to singular CFTs. Yeah, so the application to singular CFTs is, um, is that, okay, if you have a singular CFT, it's right here that classically the bulk has to have a cosmological singularity that goes all the way out to the boundary at finite time. Okay, not like a black hole singularity. The singularity actually has to cut off evolution in the asymptotic region. In the full space. In the full space. So that's classically you can't evolve past that. And moreover, even in quantum gravity, that singularity cannot be resolved into a bounce which would then uh, uh, evolve into another semi-classical metric with its own asymptotically ADS region. That's what I want to argue. Does it take into account all loop effects in the CFTs? When you start, uh, because you stir it with an infinite uh, <coughs> T nu nu in the quantum T nu nu in the CFT. But, but the CFT gravity is not dynamical. So, so you, you no, can do the, the full... CFT itself. Okay. You, you need non-perturbative. You can create back reaction effects, I mean, when I stir something with infinite strength, yeah. I expect that it reacts, even the CFT, um, soft object of CFT. Yeah. Um, it, it's, um, anyway, we can keep that for yeah, more discussion. Yeah, we can keep that for more discussion. Okay, let me just try to finish up soon. Um, okay, so there were, you know, you could think of uh, ways out. Um, you might think about adding couplings between these CFTs to get, you know, signals from one to the other. But because one CFT is sort of entirely to the future relative to the other according to the bulk, if you add couplings, you're going to be able to send signals backward in time. That'd be a problem for causality. 
you could try just to make up a rule which says, okay, you evolve in one CFT and then you know, whatever state you end up with, you, you, you start with the other one. Um, there's no natural rule. And furthermore, it would sort of violate, I think, the spirit of the duality. That rule would not be part of the original CFTs. It would have to be extra input. And, and so it wouldn't be equivalent. Um, the two sides wouldn't be equivalent without some extra information. And furthermore, there's no natural way to identify the states. The states don't evolve to some nice fixed state at the end. So it, just, I, it seems to me it's just very unnatural and I, the conclusions follow. Okay, so in my last two minutes, I'm going to just say a few words about how to recover uh, the space-time metric from the dual field theory. And we're going to work in the so-called large N regime where you expect there to be a classical metric um, in the bulk. Okay. Most people thinking about this today have come to the conclusion that the way the space-time geometry is going to emerge has something to do with quantum entanglement in the uh, boundary dual theory. Um, so I'll say a few words about that. Um, I had thought about giving an alternative approach. I've done some work uh, which gives, uses a different method, but, but we'll just leave it at this. This is what most people think is important. Okay, so um, given a quantum state, psi, and a region of space, so, so here is some, some space, and you pick out a subregion, we'll call it B, the complement of it we'll call C, um, and you we start with... the CFT here. We are at in, on the boundary. Yes, yes. You should think of this as something in the boundary. Right. Good. Um, and this is space-time or space? This is just space right now, no time. Right, right now I'm just thinking about a moment of space. Um, good. And so standard you know, quantum theory says that the information contained inside B, the result of any measurements uh, you want to do localized in this region, uh, is contained in this so-called density matrix, which you, take by, uh, which you get by taking the state uh, psi, <coughs> multiplying it by its dual, and, and tracing over all uh, the degrees of freedom outside of B. Okay, so psi covers both B and C. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the original state psi, it's a pure state on the entire system, including B and C. Exactly. So you get a density matrix, and then you can define what's called the entanglement entropy um, of this density matrix, which is just minus the trace of rho log rho. Okay, so that's a measure of, of the entanglement between the region B and, and, and C. Now, in most cases, this is very hard to calculate. If you, if you had any sort of interacting uh, quantum system, uh, this is not an easy quantity to calculate. But about 10 years ago, um, there was a very interesting paper by Ru and Takianagi showing that in the context of holography, we have a very easy way to calculate this quantity. And what they said is that you can, okay, so, so here's now a picture, again, at one moment of time. The bulk here is sort of, this is this anti to sitter space at one moment of time. This is the boundary, which is the sphere at one moment of time. And what they said was, that if you have a certain region B, say a little bit of the boundary, uh, the entanglement entropy comes from the area of a certain surface, an extremal surface, uh, which ends on the boundary of B. So if B is some little region on the boundary here, you have surfaces which are in the bulk, they come into the bulk, but they end on the boundary of B. And the surface has to be extremal, which means if you vary it a little bit, it doesn't change its area. And what they argued, was that the entanglement entropy, this complicated field theoretic quantity, is given simply by the area of that surface divided by four. And if I put in Newton's constant, there would be a four there, and if I put in Planck's constant, it would go there. I mean, it's exactly the black hole entropy formula that Hawking and Bekenstein proposed, but now extended, so it applies not just to black holes, but to any of these extremal surfaces that go out to the boundary. And they gave uh, a lot of evidence for it, and there's now been uh, essentially field theoretic proofs um, that this is right. Uh, I should say Ru and Takianagi gave the formula when you have some time symmetry, or for static situations, and it was extended to all time-dependent situations by Hubini, uh, Rangamani, and, and Takianagi. Um, so it's a very surprising result. It says that the same black hole entropy formula can now be generalized and gives you this interesting uh, entanglement entropy. 
So in the simplest case where you have a CFT in the ground state, so the bulk is just pure anti-de-sitter space, and if you take uh, your region B, your subregion, to be a hemisphere, you say, say, suppose it's exactly half the sphere, then the extremal surface is just this red line that cuts right through the center of the space. That's the uh, extremal surface, which ends on the boundary of B. Now, Mark Van Ramsdonk and many people since have been arguing that entanglement is crucial for the, um, to reconstruct a space-time. And why does he say that? Well, if you change your state, so you no longer have the vacuum state, but you try to decrease the entanglement between, say, regions B and C, according to this formula, the area will have to decrease. So if you go back here and say, okay, I'm now going to modify my state and try to decrease the entanglement and move toward a state which is just a product of some state localized here and some state localized there, what happens is that the area of the surface gets smaller and smaller. And if you actually were to go to a product state, it would sort of go to zero, which means your space is breaking up and disconnecting. That was, that was one argument. In fact, there's, there's more. The limit, if you had a state with no entanglement with, with, uh, in B and C, you can show just from the field theory that the stress tensor must diverge on that boundary. And that singularity on the boundary, as we were saying before, is going to propagate into the bulk and cause the whole space now to be singular um, uh, all along the surface. It, it just becomes a singularity in the bulk. Um, so space sort of breaks up that way. Um, moreover, you can actually reconstruct Einstein's equation, um, at least to first and second order. This is now perturbing away from anti de Sitter space from properties of this entanglement entropy. So there are general properties of, of this uh, in quantity. There's a first law for entanglement entropy and, and things like that. And using these general properties, people have shown that um, you perturb the state on the field theory, you, you correspond to some perturbation of the metric. Because of the properties of, of this has to satisfy, the perturbation of the metric has to satisfy Einstein's equation to first and second order at least. They're, they're working on getting the general thing, but they're not, they're not there yet. Okay, so, so the dynamics. Einstein's equation is actually recovered, at least in some limit, by properties of this quantity. So all of this is very encouraging. And, and furthermore, I mean, I should just say that if we uh, go back to the general definition, the area of this extremal surface certainly knows about um, the metric. It depends on the metric in the bulk. And you could imagine, well, if you had the entanglement entropy for all possible subregions of the boundary, you would know the area of all these possible surfaces, that you should have enough information to reconstruct the metric everywhere. Okay, so that's somehow the hope that, that there'll be a way to do that. Uh, there's no general formula yet, but, um, except in some special cases. But that's the idea. And, and so now I'm, I'm over time, so let me just finish. I'll skip over this other stuff I was going to talk about, but um, come to the conclusions. What is space-time and string theory? So, first of all, I've told you that perturbatively, uh, the metric simply appears as coupling constants in a two-dimensional quantum theory, this so-called sigma model. Uh, we've seen that non-perturbatively, space-time emerges from a holographic dual theory, um, at least with this ADS boundary conditions. And I haven't stressed yet, but, but I want to stress that from this viewpoint, Space-time is not emerging from strings. The strings themselves also come from the dual gauge theory. So you get strings, you get space-time, you get everything uh, from this dual theory. Uh, we've seen that topology can change in a non-singular way in string theory and may not even be well-defined. And um, I've argued that one cannot pass through certain cosmological or black hole singularities. So the picture of space-time and string theory is still incomplete, but it looks very different from general relativity, and fortunately new pieces are filled in every day. Thank you very much. Um, so the relations between space-time entanglement is apparently very interesting, but one problem 
seems to be that the Rui Takeonagi formula is only valid for up to semi-classical spacetimes. So this is not an approach that can help us learn more about quantum gravity, apparently. So because the Rui Takeonagi formula is not valid in that regime, so we cannot use it to make this translation from, C from the CFT side to the ADS side. Is that the... Is that, uh, Okay, so first of all, let me say that um, we now know uh, through work, some recent work, um, how to perturbatively correct the Rutakinagi formula. So, so to all orders in 1 over n, okay, to all perturbative corrections, including perturbative quantum gravities, there is an analogous statement, um, which I haven't given you. It's more complicated, but not that complicated. Um, so we can compute the, this entanglement entropy quite well, even with perturbative quantum corrections. Now, if you're asking, which I think is the, you know, the real question, um, if you're at finite n, if you're in the fully non-perturbative quantum gravity regime, there's always a question of, okay, you know, metric is just not a well-defined, you know, there's no semi-classical metric, you're in some full quantum gravity, how do you see that somehow emerging from some quantum gravity state? That is, um, yeah, that's not something you can use the Rutakianagi formula for, um, but these ideas, well, they're I don't know. There, there are various ideas. I mean, there's a structure there. We've got to get the metric in the end. I think we just have to understand better how to do that. So it's essentially the problem that we cannot have uh, space superpositions of space times. Or oh, we can. Okay. Oh, no problem with superpositions. They're just not semi-classical. So yeah, you can consider superpositions. You can consider states in which the metric is wildly fluctuating. So you wouldn't say it had any sort of definite value at any point. Those should all be allowed states. Uh, you can sort of think of you know possible dual field theory states describing that um, they just would not be in a regime where we had a semi-classical bulk a description but they should all be there in quantum gravity yeah. yes mm, just a question about your um, a slide and transparency and mirror symmetry okay um, I'm, I'm just curious about K and K prime yeah um, is there a topological relationship between these? K is not equal to K prime. Right? No, 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 they're, they're not. Um, but in fact, um, there is a very definite topological relation. Um, so the topology of one is, is related to the topology of, of, of the other in, in a well-defined way. Um, so, so these are complex manifolds. And so there's certain, you know. Is there a homomorphism or isomorphism? I'm, I'm just curious as what kind of. Uh... No, there's no isomorphism. I and mean, they're, they're really topologically different. But it's something like there's a so called Hodge diamond. Um, there, there's, if you look at uh, cohomology of complex manifolds, it's a little more intricate. Um, and, and there's relations uh, between the sort of Hodge diamond of K and the Hodge diamond of K prime. I mean, given one, you, can, you know what the other one is. Some of the numbers get flipped. It's mirror inversion. Mm. It's mirror inversion, like yeah. So how's the how's the first triangle is mirror in, inverted? I see. So maybe that's the origin of mirror symmetry. Yeah. That's where the name comes from. Yeah, oh. maybe. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, this uh, top each one one goes there and down. Like yeah. Inversion. Yeah. So so there is this sort of Hodge diamond which has topological information about these complex manifolds. And certainly, if you had one, you know what the other one is. It's different, but it's maybe a mirror image of it. So there is a relation. Oh, definitely. Also, the other other characteristics of two different means they are sort of relate these other characteristics. Maybe some someone has two hundred, maybe another has one hundred one. Means they're related in such a way. Right. Means if you yeah. calculate this. Uh -huh. Because Otherwise, you can't say it would be equal. Otherwise, you, you cannot have a symmetry if there was absolutely no... No, 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 no. It's, it's not arbitrary. You can't pick any two, you know, Clavials and have this happen. It's very special. Okay. Yeah, very special pairs. Carlo. This uh, real technology uh, relation that you discussed at the end is, is, is obviously very uh, intriguing. And uh, I will make it two small comments. The second is a, it's a question to you, I guess. Um, the first is that uh, it happens also in spin forms. Uh, there are some recent papers. If you take a spin form with boundary and you put uh, on, the, on the boundary a state uh, and divide the boundary in two and you want uh, the state to be uh, correlated, to entangle the left from the right, uh, 
um, then uh, uh, necessarily there is a minimal way of cutting the screen form with an area. <laughs> I say. Uh, which is determined by the amount of correlation, which is sort of becomes intuitive because every um, every spin one half carries one bit of correlation. Uh, so when you have uh, to, to carry n bit of correlation, you have spin j, and that's area j by, by definition, by construction, it's usually something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that was the first comment. The second comment, which is more of a question, was that um, suppose we take that seriously, and uh, we want to read into that uh, something about our understanding of relation, of the general relation entropy area, and black holes, and so on and so forth. Isn't this telling us that um, if you have a surface with an area, the corresponding entropy <laughs> is the entropy obtained, uh, um, is the von Neumann entropy of the correlation, uh, and uh, it's perfectly possible that on either side the actual possible number of states of the system there is much larger. Um, Doesn't I'm this go punching against what so many people say about entropy okay. having having to be understood as the number of possible states on the other side and it goes instead of interpretation of entropy as yes entropy but in the sense of the von Neumann correlation entropy um, between the two systems. Um, well in the field theory yeah um, well, in the field theory, you just have this entanglement entropy. So you want to interpret it now in the bulk, because it's related to this area in the bulk. Um, well, either. Even, even in the field theory, I mean, there's, a, there's a one side to the other side. There's an area. I, I don't know how you want to read it. It's a, yeah. They're just um, screaming to say this is an entanglement entropy. This is not number of states on the other side. Uh, maybe. I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> so, um, um, very enamored with holography like you and everybody else. However, in a way it's incredibly disappointing <laughs> that uh, the quantum nature of space-time is being explained to us by telling us, okay, over here I have this completely classical space-time, which where nothing I know about space-time has changed. That's the space-time where the CFT lives. Yeah. It's a standard fixed Lorentzian signature space-time. Of course, it only depends on the conformal structure. But and now I'm explaining quantum the quantum nature of space-time in terms of that. That just seems like not what I would have expected. Well, that's not what we're doing. Let, let me object. I mean, this is not at all. We're not getting quantum gravity out yes, of some fixed space-time on the boundary. Why not? Because the. <laughs> It's the gauge fields which to give us quantum gravity. The fixed space-time on the boundary is a boundary condition. When I said the other day that uh, it seems to me that... No, wait, I don't know, come get This is like oh, uh, semantics. We have an ordinary quantum field theory on an ordinary fixed space-time. Yeah. With light cones and everything that are all fixed. And yeah. we're constructing out of it a quantum space-time that... Yeah. But okay. a quantum space-time which is constrained by saying that we have asymptotically ADS boundary conditions, we're not allowing the metric to fluctuate at very large distance. We, we, we somehow quantize only those excitations which go to zero at infinity, and we're demanding as a boundary condition that, that we have this asymptotic fixed metric. I mean, I, I think quantum gravity is like that, where, where, where the theory could depend on your boundary condition, and, and you know, asymptotically flat quantum gravity might look different than asymptotic ADS, and compact universes could be different um, because, you know, we have this property that the Hamiltonian is, is entirely a boundary term. So it, it does sound like there's going to be dependence on your boundary condition, and in this case, we require that the... It doesn't constrain, obviously, anything in the bulk. We think all sorts of things you can do in, in quantum gravity, and you can do in ADS, you just put you know, the you know, cosmological, the radius of curvature very, very big, and you could describe all quantum gravity processes we'd like to describe, um, and just put it in this giant box. Does the real universe has such a boundary? Our in universe? Yes. Yeah, so no, I don't think so. But my attitude toward that is, this is a, a, a model, if you want, uh, a case where we can study or explore non-perturbative quantum gravity, where everything that we expect to happen in our universe, well, almost everything, could be you know, modeled in this way with the ADS. 
boundary? No, I don't think our universe has an ABS boundary. Every, all the indications are it's more like desitter asymptotically. But um, it doesn't mean that we can't learn a lot about quantum gravity by studying it. Yes. Yeah, it's a small caveat. Maybe uh, if S2 is kind of real thing, it should be CP1. Otherwise, it's a yeah. number of rational curves. It, it, it is CP1. No, you, so. you, you're right. I, I put S2 because I just thought it'd be more familiar. No, otherwise, it's complex. Many, no, many, yeah, many. no, you're, you're right. It, it, it's CP1. Kind of yeah, we see that in some view as a, as a, as a complex. complex exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. S2 is one that makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. How? Like, why can't our universe be ABS at the 100 billion years scales? And I didn't get your comment. How are we sure we are not in a box? <laughs> oh, oh, I see. So you're saying that we might be in some bubble which is inflating, but at very large distance why it could not? still be asymptotically ADS? Is um, there an argument? No, I don't, I don't think there's an argument against that. Maybe I gave in too quickly. <laughs> that if that was the case, then it would better be that if this theory is to describe our world, this theory would have observables that don't sit just on the boundary, since we're not 100 billion years from here. So the theory would, if that was the case, if you want to think this way, then the theory should be completed uh, with the observable, with the bulk observables. No, 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 no. no the, 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 there are local. Would be there are definitely local observables in in the bulk, which are described by complicated combinations of operators on the boundary. Right, 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 right. So, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the observables in our world would have some description on the boundary. They just wouldn't be local operators on the boundary. They'd be some, you know, very non-local thing. That's the way this dictionary works. And could you just forget about it? Just talk about this local operators. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we don't. Okay, well, all right. That's. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Question: Entanglement is it symmetrical in B and C or not? What you call the entanglement? Yes. Entropy. Yes. 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 The entanglement so entropy is the same. Inside and outside, it is the same. It's the same. Okay. So one of your slides brought up an old question that I've never remembered to ask the right people at the right time. <laughs> uh, in your first slide on cosmic censorship, you argued that because the CFT continues on just fine at, at the boundary that uh, you couldn't have uh, a uh, things happening that are too bad in the interior. Well, classically, they could be terrible, but I'm saying that quantum gravity right. will always resolve right. them. Right. So there's an assumption in there that I, I just want to understand how strong the assumption is. There's an assumption that whatever happens in the interior, or whatever your initial data was that causes what happens in the interior, it is not bad enough to disrupt the asymptotically anti de Sitter uh, nature of the space-time. Now, I don't know what the status is. I know that for asymptotically flat space-times that it's been discovered that uh, generic initial data actually doesn't typically produce the kind of asymptotically simple structure that, or at least doesn't give all of the the uh, the peeling properties that have been assumed. What do you know? What the status is of things like that for ADS? How much how much freedom you're allowed in your initial data? Um, well, as you know, one of the surprises recently has been that anti de Sitter is not um, stable in, in the sense that Minkowski space is, as it was shown. Famously, that if you perturb Minkowski space by a small finite perturbation, you always can globally evolve for all time. You have a nice null infinity. Nothing ever goes wrong. Um, and it stays close to Minkowski space everywhere. For anti de Sitter, um, at linear order, it's perfectly stable. Everything just oscillates. It's like having a lot of harmonic oscillators. Modes oscillate forever. Nothing blows up. However, it was found a few years ago that if you include nonlinear effects, generically, after many oscillations, these waves um, become uh, more and more focused, and you always form black holes. 
small black holes. You add a little bit of energy, you form little tiny black holes, but you can get large deviations from ADS. You mean asymptotic? No. What's that? Not asymptotic. No, no, uh, the, the boundary is fine. Yeah. yeah, somewhere in the interior you form a black hole, but the boundary is fine. I mean, you're, you're wondering... You're asking how stable is the boundary. Um, I think... Now, I don't know how, how rigorously this is proven. I mean, there, there are results that if you fix the metric on the boundary, you need some boundary condition, and you fix initial data, um, general relativity is supposed to have... Now, of course, we don't know if cosmic censorship is true, so you could have evolution stop in the bulk because of naked singularities, mm -hmm. but you're asking if there could be some sort of singular pulse that goes out and destroys the asymptotics. Right. Um, I don't know, I don't know if you can do that with finite energy. That sounds hard okay. to do. Can I energy? propose something? Maybe the last question by Thibault and then coffee with that. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah just uh, it's, it's more of a comment. Uh, <coughs> like uh, most people here, uh, I love uh, the ADS CFT and it brought us uh, new lessons. But I, I want to remind people to connect with the talk of Gabriele that uh, if we go back to the early days of string theory, I mean, you had uh, uh, vertex operators in a CFT, which was the two-dimensional CFT introduced by Fubini and Veneziano. You give a certain number of vertex operators that describe incoming states, like 10 to the 20 gravitons at ultra high energy, and you create a quantum, a very curved space-time, including black holes, and the, the problem, as Gabriel described, is that it's difficult still to reach the quantum gravity thing, but you can get close to it with this thing. And uh, ADS-CFT has not <coughs> taught us much more than this from the point of view of seeing a black hole that you create and how it evaporates, because Gabriel did not uh, go all the way, but in principle one can explore in this old string theory way also how to create a black hole and see in the S matrix if it is unitary and how it evaporates. In principle, if in we knew how to compute things. Here, in principle, it's more non-perturbative, but we still don't know how to compute everything. No? I mean, but in other words, is there a, a problem on the boundary that can be mapped into with asymptotic? Yes, of course. Well, sure. I mean, there's because a problem where you say somehow if you form a small black hole, you, know, okay. you put T mu news that would create. Should, a yeah, no, you can you can set up states which in the bulk would have particles come in, form a small black hole, and have it evaporate. Yeah. It the question is, nice can you to, compute to, to do a computation? Yeah. But the question is, can you compute? Yeah. Because exactly. Gabriele and yeah. Daniele Amati and right. Marcello Chaffoloni can compute. Well, but to some in point. In the bulk directly, mm -hmm. but it's hard. It's get. It's the question is whether and the correspondence can help. But I, I, don't know how to, I don't know a practical a way to calculate that. Yeah. I don't think the word in principle is correct. Ah. Because Gabriele will never calculate non-perturbative effects in G-string in what he does, right? I mean, you cannot hope to get those. No, so if, say, no. evaporation times were to be non-perturbative or something else, but, uh, I think they you'll are. never see it. But, but uh, they are perturbative, right? Yeah. I think. <laughs> and here we need, what, low end? I mean, yes. finite end. Finite end. Can we do numerical calculation in principle? Oh, yeah, there are calculations. Lots of people yeah. doing calculations for the gauge three at finite end. And, and including cases that do describe a black hole form, that you were, were, were mentioning those. Uh, there are in, calculations in, which are two like plus one uh, and yeah. Okay, yeah, let's continue our talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much.